Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. This afternoon, we're joined by Jonathan Carl, the Chief White House Correspondent and Chief Washington Correspondent for ABC News. Carl has covered some of Washington, D.C.'s most important beats, including four presidential administrations, Capitol Hill, the Pentagon, and the State Department. He was president of the White House Correspondents Association from 2019 to 2020 and has earned the Walter Cronkite Award for National Individual Achievement, an Emmy and the Everett McKinley Dirksen Award, the highest honor for congressional reporting. The author of Front Row at the Trump Show, an instant New York Times bestseller, Carl Peel peered behind the scenes into the President Trump and his allies' unprecedented actions. He continues the story with what's sure to be another instant bestseller, The Trail, The Final Act of the Trump Show. Today, he'll be in conversation with Tamala Edwards, anchor of 6ABC Action News Morning Edition. Thank you both so much for joining us. The screen is yours. All right, John, thanks for being here. And it feels like five minutes ago, you were one of those young people along with Farai Chidea and Kellyanne Conway, who was Kellyanne, I think Fitzpatrick, on CNN, and you've gone on to do some wonderful work, including this book. Uh, you had covered the White House for quite a while. You did write that first book, Front Row at the Trump Show, and you get to this last year, which is the subject of betrayal. And it stood out to me that in a number of instances, you say that something shocks you. And I wanted you to put that in context because you've covered quite a few people and quite a few places. And I would imagine it, it takes a bit to shock you. Yeah, well, first of all, Tim, uh, thank you to the uh, Free Library of Philadelphia and thank you to you for being here. I mean, I, I go way, way back with you. We were running around covering a campaign that seems like uh, generations ago. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe back one, when it was normal. Yeah. Um, I, I covered the events of 2020 as a reporter for ABC News day in and day out. Um, I covered all that unfolded uh, and it was truly... Um, I thought I had as good a handle as anybody on, on what was going on. But when I stepped back to write this book, and I knew I was going to write this book um, as, as, I, as 2020 emerged, and it was quickly apparent by the spring that this was going to be a year unlike any other, uh, that I needed, to, I needed to write a sequel to Front Row at the Trump Show. So I started taking notes way back then. Uh, but when Trump left the White House, I went back and methodically went back to look at almost a day by day for the reporting of this book, a day by day recreation of 2020. So I could know how to kind of put this massive year and the crisis we all faced into some kind of uh, context. And I went back and interviewed the key players. I interviewed um, people to find out what was really going on uh, at, at the big major turning points. And what I found out that was shocking and truly shocking <clears throat> and should shock and horrify all of us is that as awful as 2020 was and as awful as the aftermath of the election was in January 6th, we were actually much closer to a greater disaster uh, than, than anything that certainly I realized at the time. And I'll just give you one example. And there are many examples in the book. Um, we all knew that Michael Flynn, who was the former national security advisor and a retired three-star general, uh, went out publicly uh, in, uh, in late 2020 and said uh, that, that martial law should be imposed and that, that the election should be rerun. I mean, really a shocking thing for anybody to say, but who cares? He's just some crackpot, right? But what I learned is that he actually reached out directly to one of the most powerful and important officials at the Pentagon, who was seen by the world as a Flynn protege. Uh, Ezra Cohen, who was the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, that is the civilian official with direct responsibility for the Special Operations uh, Forces and, and much else. And he had worked for Flynn on the National Security Council. He had worked under Flynn at the Defense Intelligence Agency. And Flynn wanted him to activate you know, God knows what, but wanted him to take steps to use the military to seize voting machines in the states under under consideration, uh, under under con that Trump was contesting. 
it didn't happen because Cohen told him effectively to get lost, but Flynn thought it was going to happen. And there's nothing in, you know, Ezra Cohen's background that would lead you to think that he was going to tell somebody who had been seen by the world as his mentor, uh, you know, to, to, to know. And, and, and things like that were going on. Sidney Powell was in direct contact with the director of national intelligence. Um, Mark Meadows was, was pushing the Pentagon and the Justice Department to investigate bizarre and outlandish and QAnon-esque uh, conspiracy theories. This is all stuff that was not known at the time, but I uncovered for this book. And you, towards the end of the book, when you talk about January 6th, and it's a last minute choice for them to take the electors' votes in those um, yeah. old world mahogany boxes, if they had left them behind and they'd been destroyed or something had happened, we would have been in a world beyond law because you're supposed to use the originals and nobody knows. And it kind of feels like that was the case at multiple points that if Ezra Cohen had gone through with this, if other people had gone through with what they were being asked to do, we might have been in a place beyond law or we wouldn't have known what to do. And in that place, it he might have gotten away with it. Yes, he may have gotten away from he might not have gotten away for it for long. It might have taken uh, it might have taken a military clash to stop it. Uh, the, the, there could have been bloodshed on the street beyond what we already saw. Uh, the, the mahogany boxes is, is, is a small window on all this and something that I became <clears throat> rather obsessed with. <clears throat> Under the Constitution, you know, we have a specific procedure that must be followed and has been followed by every election since the election of George Washington for the casting of ballots, the counting of, of the, you know, the states sending in those electoral votes, the opening of those votes, the counting of the votes. It goes by a calendar. Originals uh, must be what are sent in, as you mentioned. Also, they must be signed in a specific way by specific officials in each of the states, all of that. And when the Senate was evacuated in a rush evacuation, uh, because the rioters were already inside the building, um, a young staffer with the uh, parliamentarian's office, a woman who does not want her name to be out there, um, somebody who served the country in ways that mo most people have no idea, uh, said, wait, we have to grab those boxes because they contain the ballots. And she did, and they were preserved. And if you look at what happened on January 6th, the, the place that was ransacked the most of any room in the Capitol was the parliamentarian's office. And I believe firmly that the reason why the rioters went to that room is they were looking for those votes and they wanted to destroy them because they knew that those were necessary under our constitution to the uh, certification of, of, of Joe Biden's uh, victory. So, you know, that's one moment. And, and like I said, there, are, there were many others. You know, that is the work of the House Committee right now trying to figure out who knew what when. There's a moment in the book where Mark Meadows says something that pricked your ears in your reporting that made you wonder what he knew and when. Obviously, this investigation is going on. Do you think this was a group of people who had no idea what they were doing? Or this was a group of people who did have some inside baseball on what to look for and what to do? Uh, it was a group of people that, in some sense, were colossally incompetent, and, and that also saved us. Um, you know, Mark Meadows uh, had a fundamental un misunderstanding of how the process works, and at one point, he thought that if the, uh, if the House and the Senate each had a people objecting, that there would be a simple vote of the congressional delegations, then that would determine who the president was. That, that's obviously not the case. Uh, that's not how that's not how it's done. And, and he was actually corrected in real time uh, by by Kevin McCarthy on on that point. But, um, you know, the, 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 the ultimate solution that they that were out was outlined in another a memo that I was able to see its existence had never been known before, uh, written by one of the Trump campaign's lawyers and forwarded by Mark Meadows to uh, to the chief of staff in the vice president's office on on New Year's Eve about how this was supposed to go down. And the way it was supposed to go down was, you know, Pence was gonna, was gonna throw out the ballots, basically send them back to the states to be redone on the, in, in the six states that, that Trump was objecting to. And then nobody would have a, a 
a full majority of electoral votes. And then under that scenario, it is a vote by congressional delegation in the House for president and the Senate for vice president. And in the House, the Republicans control 26 electoral, uh, 26 delegations. So theoretically, if they all voted for Trump, boom, he would win. But here's what they didn't realize, <laughs> just a basic fact. They actually count those votes um, by, by alphabetical order. So you know, your Alabamas and Arkansas and um, and, and Alaska's uh, are, are first, and then you go down, you know, you get through Pennsylvania and you go down and finally, where do you end up? What's the 50th state alphabetically? It's Wyoming. Uh -huh. It has a house delegation with one member of the house. What's her name? Liz oh, Cheney. you're not supposed to do pop quizzes. Liz Cheney, Liz Cheney. <laughs> So, hey, well, there's a lot of drama. What's Liz Cheney going to say? Uh, you know, she's already- Oh, there's going to be bad words the used. The election. So, so the, the, these people were, were, were colossally incompetent. And one of, the, one of the really fearful things when you mentioned, the, you know, the future is if we were to see this, anything like this happen again, and the Trump were able to somehow mount a comeback, something I think is preposterously low possibility, but not, but not impossible. Um, this this was a dry run, and uh, you know they Somebody wouldn't make, smarter and better. They wouldn't make they wouldn't make the same mistakes again. The book is full of lots of points of drama around this, and uh, that Trump official is Johnny McEntee. We'll talk about him in a moment. But there's a moment where Trump is really pressing Mike Pence, and they're trying to just throw this legalese bullshit at him, and. The moment turns to me, it seems, on Pence saying, you know what, I've got a law degree too. And it was just finally a, you can't get this crap past me. But I thought to myself, what if he didn't? And he turned to his, his staffers and said, well, that kind of makes sense. Like I'm thinking from here on out, every government official needs to have a law degree. Well, and also think about it this way. Mike Pence was the most loyal vice president in the history of the American vice presidency. He did everything Trump wanted of him. He never once publicly disagreed with Trump. Even in that first campaign, when the Access Hollywood tape dropped, Pence didn't do anything to distance himself or criticize Donald Trump. So there was nothing in Pence's background that would lead you to believe that he would be the one that would stand up and say no to Donald Trump, but he did. And the meeting you're describing happened on December 4th. And it was a last minute, you know, Pence had been in, in, um, in Georgia campaigning for those two Republican candidates. He had just, he was just about to land at Andrews Air Force Base, and he got a message from the White House, the president wants to see you as soon as you get in. Trump was going that night to his, give his own speech down in Georgia. Marine One was already on the South Lawn, the hell, the, you know, the, the propellers going, and he gets there. And he's basically sandbagged. He, you know, John Eastman, this 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 wacky outside lawyer uh, who had argued during the campaign that Kamala Harris wasn't truly an American citizen and therefore was ineligible to be vice president. I mean, really, these were th this was the legal advice he was getting, and um, and he goes in uh, to the Oval Office and they and they start hammering him and say Jefferson did this. Jefferson had secured his own. Uh, election victory, you know, when he was vice president and, you know, ruled in ways favorable for himself. Uh, Nixon, uh, you know, uh, uh, made a, his decision on the, you know, all the, they, all these historical examples that were all bogus. And by the way, I go through in the book and explain why each one of these things was bogus. And Pence knew it as well. And he had studied it and he had done his homework. And to his credit, he'd end up doing the right thing. But you're right. What would have happened if he didn't? Okay, you know, I know, everybody who studied the Constitution and is honest about it knows he had no power to single-handedly overturn a, a presidential election. It's absurd. But what if he had tried? He's presiding over the counting of the votes. He's standing next to Nancy Pelosi. What's she going to do? Grab the gavel and start hitting him and say, no, no, no? I, have, I mean, what, what happens? Okay, we go to the Supreme Court. How do you go to the Supreme Court? And the Supreme Court rules, and how do you enforce the Supreme Court's decision? You and the Supreme Court and what army? If you have the, the leadership, the entire unified leadership of the executive branch basically taking power, what do you do? 
like I said, I think it would have eventually been resolved, but it would have been chaos. And it's highly likely there would have been massive bloodshed as well. You know, before we even get to this point, you talk about the lead up in the months. And I think what's hard for some Americans, it's one thing to say that somebody has a point of view. They'd rather have conservative government on taxes, on foreign policy, on social policy. But as you read the book, you ask yourself, at what cost are we willing to go? Uh, you talk about Johnny McEntee, who's running the Office of Personnel. And you're wondering why any grown up allows this to happen. Or Deborah Burke sitting in a meeting and the president is talking about people injecting themselves with bleach and she won't look you in the eye like you're trying to get her attention. Like, are you hearing this? And she's just trying to get through. And that's the image you paint is of people who know better just trying to get through before we even get to this point. And there's a big difference between the people that know better and were enablers anyway, and those who knew better but felt that by staying, they could try to prevent total disaster. Um, Anthony Fauci is in that latter camp. I mean, Anthony Fauci was was there and, and he was part of the coronavirus task force. He was certainly kind of um, pushed aside uh, as things got crazier and wackier. Uh, but you know, he felt that he needed to stay and be part of that and that, you know, resigning would have been a terrible mistake and would have, would have removed any option he had of, of trying to prevent a, a greater disaster. Um, Pat Cipollone is a character that I outline in, in some detail uh, in the book, who is a very mixed character um, in terms of his relationship with Trump. Um, and he came very close to resigning. And at one point, uh, as January 6th, in the immediate aftermath, he, he told Trump that unless he got out there and expressed some regret and, um, you know, and, and, and did the right thing, uh, that he faced removal from office, either through the 25th Amendment or through impeachment. Um, you know, he stayed. There's, there's a guy named Chris Liddell who, who handled the transition and Biden people spoke very fondly of for, for kind of running a clandestine campaign in the second floor of the West Wing. He was a deputy chief of staff. He had served Trump for all four years, but he stayed and did what he needed to do, was required to under the law, but what he needed to do um, to, to help the incoming Biden team. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of these folks. McEntee <laughs> is the most powerful and significant and crucial figure of 2020 that most people have never heard of. And he was just 29 years old when he came back into the White House and got this job as the head of presidential personnel. And th that's basically the most important HR department in the United States. It's in charge of all the hiring and firing of every political appointee in the executive branch. I mean, from the treasury secretary to the ambassador to the Bahamas, everybody has to go through the presidential personnel office. He cleaned out that office, there's like 30 people in it, and put his friends in, mostly kids in their 20s. Some of them didn't have college degrees yet. And they went out and they systematically, while all this was, was, going, was, was going on, the pandemic, the election, all of this conducted a purge of the executive branch to get rid of anybody that wasn't sufficiently loyal to Donald Trump. Often getting rid of people who had a great deal of experience. And I, I'm coming back to this question because we talked to Lawrence Wright of the New, New Yorker in this space as well. And in his book, he focused a lot on Matthew Pottinger and Deborah Burks and really laid out what you just said. If they were not there, where would we be? You know, there are people who argue politically that it's that to tell the story afterwards isn't good enough, that you should have resigned and told the world at the time. And I just wonder where you personally, having done this reporting, come out on that. It's, you know, it's, it's, I think that, I think that there are cases where that's a totally legitimate question. And there are cases where I, where I truly understand why the people stayed. And, um, you know, Matt Pottinger was one of those that took the, uh, the, the virus seriously before anybody else did inside that White House and tried to steer the response in a productive way. Matt Pottinger, I describe a, a rather vivid scene involving him. He was the deputy national security advisor um, former Wall Street Journal reporter, by the way, and a very intelligent guy. Um, and he was at a meeting when the riot, he was at a meeting outside of the White House when the riot started on January 6th. And he didn't fully understand what was going on until he got back in the White House and saw the televisions in his office. 
and he saw a report that that the White House was blocking the deployment of the National Guard. And so he marched from his office, which is just down the hallway from the Oval Office, to find out what the hell what the hell was going on. And uh, he saw chaos. He saw people running around in the outer Oval, the area outside the Oval Office. The Oval Office itself was empty. Um, Trump was in this dining room right next to the Oval Office that he often spent time in that had television sets. And he bumped and he saw Pat Cipollone running by, couldn't really get his attention. He sees Mark Meadows frantically going by and he tells Meadows, wait a minute, we need to get the National Guard deployed. Is it true that they're being blocked? And he said, no, 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 we're on it, we're on it. And he walked by. But Pottinger was so horrified by what he saw, not just on television, but inside the West Wing, that he went back to his office, he sat down and he wrote his letter of resignation. Now, should he have done that earlier? Uh, I mean, I think that that's something that will be debated, but you know, I, it can be argued that he did the right thing by staying and trying to ensure that, that the people that were in charge during the greatest crisis of our lifetimes uh, were, were, were steered in the right direction as much as he was could humanly make so um and there are other people you know that um but but then like you said there are others like mark meadows who never said no to donald trump and did nothing but enable him in all of this but he cried at elijah cummings funeral i, I don't know how you reconcile those two things let's talk about the man at the heart he of the cries, book. He actually cries a lot he's actually <laughs> seriously <laughs> you know you you covered this president for four years and in the book you know you go to mar-a-lago and talk to him when he's out of office and a lot's been made of that reporting um, where he doesn't seem to show any remorse for what happened to Mike Pence. You covered him all those days in office. And I, John, it's hard to get a bead on, does he really just not care? Or does he really believe this? He really believes this election was stolen. Um, he's all over the place. Sometimes he's gracious, stay for dinner, then he's hanging up on you. It's hard to tell what you're dealing with. And where did you come down on that by the end? I got the sense that he's become entirely deluded and he really believes it. I don't think it started out that way. I think that he looked at this, he, he feels, you know, his brand, and he's done a tremendous job building a brand over, over the course of his uh, lifetime. His brand was built on winning and being portrayed as the ultimate rich guy the winner, the guy that never loses, the guy that makes all the best deals. He managed to create the perception of that even when he was going through four bankruptcies. This was his brand. And he knows, and I, and I dug up this quote that I uh, hadn't found until I was doing the research on, on the book from a, from a 2015 interview with, uh, with Donald Trump. And it's, it's, with, it's with a reporter, I think he was a reporter for Newsday, was working on a book project. And Trump describes that if you, you cannot lose and you cannot acknowledge you've lost because then people will look at you as a loser. So it's all, it's all built on the perception of winning, even if the reality of winning is not there. And that's what he did. He realized, at least he felt, I don't think this is true at all. He felt though, that all those people out there who would, who would support him if he shot somebody on Fifth Avenue, all those you know, fervent Trump supporters were following him because he believed, because they believed that he was a guy that didn't lose. Now, if he actually lost, oh my God, they would run from him. And, and that's why I think initially it was strategic. Um, but as it went on, I mean, when I saw that guy you know, in March of this year in Mar-a-Lago, and I looked into his eyes and I heard all the stuff. He, this was somebody that actually believed it. He really believes that, that the election was stolen from him. There's no way he lost. And I would I imagine that, 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 that frightened you. That's more dangerous. Then like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. moved on to the next deal. And, you know, and by the way, I think this is a really important point. Um, roughly 40% of the country, I don't know if it's 30 or 40 or where it is, but, but there's a good chunk of the country that actually believes the same thing and um, believes the election was stolen, that Trump really won. And I think that we have to take that seriously and we have to explain and be very factual and dispassionate about why it's false. Because there are actually good reasons why so many people believe it. They believe it, one, because you have somebody with a very powerful bully pulpit who has repeated the lie so many times that it sounds like it's true to, to some people. But 
there, there are two other factors. One, if you were if you went anywhere near a Trump rally in the in October of 2020, um, you would have seen a packed event that people waited for hours to come into. You would have seen it, particularly in those northern states, all, all of the rallies were outdoors because of coronavirus. People waited out in freezing cold temperatures. Uh, I, I recount one event in Nebraska uh, where 30 people had to be treated for various forms of hypothermia and frostbite and, and you know, went to see this guy. And they packed in and they started chanting at those last rallies, we love you, we love you. If you went and you saw you know, a Joe Biden event, you would have said Biden was taking a much low-key, more low-key approach because of COVID. He did some events, much fewer. They were all drive-in events that were not widely attended uh, in comparison to the Trump events because they were drive-in events and because people were being careful. Um, but watching that dichotomy, you thought, my God, he's going to win. But then secondly, if you were watching the election results come in, you would have seen that at 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock at night, Trump was ahead. He was got a huge lead in Pennsylvania, 200,000 plus votes. He was winning in Michigan. He was winning in Wisconsin. It looked like he was on his way to reelection. Now, you and I know, and anybody that's taken time to look at this, why that was the case. We know, especially in Pennsylvania, that, that they had this system that Republicans made, you know, insisted that those mail-in ballots couldn't even be opened and started to process until polls closed. And we knew why it takes time because of a verification process. We know all of that. But again, most Americans are sitting there tuning in, see Trump's ahead, they go to bed, they wake up, suddenly he's losing, what the heck's going on? So it, it's important for us as journalists to take time and explain why it's a lie. Not just say it's a lie, explain in detail why it's a lie. And that, as you know, from reading the book, I go into some detail on each and every one of those claims, the major claims that Trump makes to show why they're, can I say BS? Oh um, yeah. Okay. It's just 145 friends. I think you're, you're okay. okay. You know, uh, as, as Bill Barr, Bill Barr of all people told me it's all bullshit, but you can't just say it. You have to show why. And that's what I tried to do. But here's a question about that. You've been in Washington a long time and the Democrats are faced with an interesting question. I mean, Ted Cruz got shot down by Margaret Brennan this week on the talk shows because he's still pushing this idea that people don't think that elections have integrity. And she kept saying this is based on a lie. But for the Democrats, is that the wisest course of action to say, but this is a lie or to say, OK, fine. We'll change the system. We'll write a voter ID bill. We'll come up with these rules and and incorporate some of what you're saying, so that we kind of try to you know inoculate ourselves with the smallpox. Take a little bit of what you're doing. You've yeah. been there a long time. Is there something to that, or no? You can't go down that road. First of all, something that is very dangerous, uh, especially in the current climate, is to see at the state level or at the federal level changes made in our election processes and our election laws that are made under a pure party line process. That is a big mistake. Uh, if there's anything that must be nonpartisan, it's how we conduct our elections. So I think you're onto something really important. What we need in this country is a bipartisan group of, of, of respected and trusted people to take a look at the way we conduct our elections and address some of the, uh, you know, some of the fears of, of, you know, fraud and all that, which, like I said, not all the people saying this are bad people. They have reasons. They, they've been told things that are untrue. They've seen things with their own eyes that make them question the, the system. So be transparent and do things like, say, uh, yes, voter ID, which is something that, you know, many on the left have, have objected to for a long time. Okay. Voter ID. We can do vote. We have a big, powerful country. We can ensure that everybody in this country has an ID. They may not have driver's license. We will ensure that everybody has an ID so they can vote and we will require it for voting. And then in the process of counting our votes. And again, it's tricky because it, because this is rules are established at the state level. I mean, and that's also under the Constitution. But what happened in Pennsylvania is awful. That, that, that there was actually a provision that said that the the state was not allowed 
to start processing mail-in votes until the polls closed. Why? Why? I mean, that created the situation that it took days to really know what was happening and what the results were. You can look to Georgia or look to Ohio. Look to Ohio. Ohio is a state where the, the mail-in vote, the absentee vote, uh, the early vote is processed, not counted, but processed as the vote comes in. That means they're, the, the, the ballots are looked at, signature match, you know, barcodes to make sure people aren't voting twice, all of that. And by the way, be transparent about all, there's safeguards and all this stuff. And so in Ohio, the first votes that were counted, the, Ohio is, nobody talks about this. Ohio is the exact opposite of Pennsylvania. Ohio, the very first votes that were counted were the early votes. So guess what? If you looked at Ohio, Joe Biden had a big lead in Ohio right after polls closed, a big lead because the early votes, Democrats are more likely to vote early, were, were processed first. And then it went away and, Joe, and, and Donald Trump won big in Ohio, not because there was fraud, but because that's how they process the votes. The exact okay. reverse of the system in Pennsylvania. Well, let's talk a little bit about January 6th because you go into detail and you really do lay out another vantage point of just how frightening and close it came. It's amazing that nobody was killed, that we didn't have somebody hung or shot. And uh, there's a co former congressman who's now a Biden official who's standing in the old post office. It's called the Abe Lincoln post office because he used to go there, which had a trap door in the floor, thank goodness. And he's watching these people advance and he's saying to himself, I don't understand. I'm pretty sure if Black people were doing this, he's a Black congressman, they'd be shot by now. Is he on to something that if the racial makeup of the group had been different, the day might have been different, or the element of surprise, it would have turned out the same no matter what? First off, it, the congressman is Cedric Richmond, and he is now one of the top officials in the White House. Uh, he was uh, a co-chair of the Biden campaign, one of Biden's early and most important supporters. And by happenstance, he ended up being in this area, this, this old post office area that's, that, that, that's now called the, uh, the Lincoln Room. Really amazing. I mean, just, just the, you know, like I said, history always surrounds you when you walk around the Capitol building, but sometimes it's really close. And, and this, was, this was rather amazing because he was alone. It was just Cedric Richmond. And as the rioters came in, he barricaded himself in that room. And then he was trying to figure out what, what do I do if they come in and, and you know, try to get me. And he, he knew because he had given tours to guests, you know, visitors in the Capitol, there is a trap door in that room. And he didn't even know where it led, but he looked at it and he was ready to go down that trap door if he needed to hide. But he, his reaction when he saw those rioters come in was one of anger. Um, and as you said, he was thinking to himself, if these were black people, they wouldn't be, you know, just marching past police barricades, you know, the, 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 there would be people that would have been shot. Um, I don't know if he is right or wrong about that, but I know that, that that feeling was one that a lot of people had watching it unfold on television, and he was watching it much closer than that. It was certainly something that I thought as I was watching all of this unfold. Um, you know, the Capitol Police, uh, it's, it's a different kind of police force. Um, and um, they're, they're an event like that, you know, they, they, they've had, certainly they've had scary events that have happened on the Hill, but nothing, anything remotely like that. And they were, you know, entirely caught by surprise, um, which is another thing that the January 6th committee should look, look into as to, you know, how that happened. Um, but, but Cedric Richmond's um, experience, I think, is one of the most vivid stories that, that I heard uh, of it all, because he was right there. That, that Lincoln Room is right off Statuary Hall. All of those rioters went right outside the door of where he was. He could hear them banging on the door, and they didn't come in because he had locked it. He had barricaded it. And by the way, he got a call from Joe Biden um, as the riot was still underway uh, to, to check on him and see where he was. Um, and, I, and I just thought that was quite moving because Donald Trump never called Mike Pence, you know, um, who was target, literally the target of the anger and was stuck inside somewhere in that complex. And he never heard. And got him. out with seconds, didn't realize how close it yeah. was. Yes. Really, really close. Yes. I, you know, one of the things that you lay out, first of all, that, uh, 
the officer who we've seen at the top of the stairs leading them away from the, the Senate chamber, people didn't realize, you know, you can see behind them, like these elderly old senators, like barely making it out before they realize they're behind them. But somebody else who had a close call was Mitt Romney, who almost walked right into the rioters. And, you know, you've done some reporting and had some conversations with Ronna McDaniel, the head of the RNC. Did she realize how close her uncle came to potentially being hurt, maybe more? And did that chasten her in any way, affect her in any way? Has she ever spoken about that? Um, she she has not spoken publicly about that, but I, I can tell you, you know, Ronna McDaniel was, was, I mean, like everybody else saw this and was horrified. Interestingly, she was at a Republican retreat down in South Carolina, I, I believe it was South Carolina, um, uh, on January 6th and did not have visibility on it until after it was over, uh, what was actually going on. Um, and you remember Trump actually called into that retreat and got a round of applause um, uh, shortly after January 6th. And, but, you know, I mean, now she's still the leader of a party. I recount, I recount a very dramatic conversation she had with Donald Trump on, on January 20th, when he was, he had just boarded Air Force One for his last trip aboard the plane to go to Florida. And Ronald McDaniel just calls to wish him farewell. And he starts basically yelling at her and saying, I have, I'm leaving the Republican party. You failed me. And I'm starting my own party. And she, you know, she's distraught by this and telling him, you're going to destroy everything. You're going to lose. We're going to lose. We'll never win again. And, she, and he said to her, that's right. You'll never win again. And, and his, his attitude was, if I lost, you should lose too. Everybody should lose if I lost. Um, and they were only able to get him to back down from that by threatening him. And it happened over the course of the next few days. Um, and I learned that they that they outlined a series of steps they would take that would have cost Trump tens of millions of dollars. And he stayed in the party. And then I think the Ronna McDaniel's surprise and everybody else's, or most everybody in the leadership of that party, he basically took it over again, even after January 6th. And actually, we continue to see January 6th be recast. Um, you know, it was just a bunch of people who got carried away. You know, there's been this big furor over the documentary that Tucker Carlson has put out. The news today is about two respected Republicans, Jonah Goldberg and Stephen Hayes, who've said, okay, that's it. We're out of Fox. We can't do this anymore. Geraldo Rivera has spoken out. But you keep, when you see that, the Republican leaders are saying, nothing to see here. Let's move on. We get nothing out of discussing this. And they're allowing it to be downplayed as not that big a deal after everything you recount. How does that, does that, I mean, you, you spend your life listening to people make political calculations. Does it make sense to you what they're doing? I can understand what they're doing in terms of cold, hard political calculation. And the calculation is that going into the midterm elections, they have a chance of retaking control of the House, retaking control of the Senate. And that the only way they can do that is if Donald Trump is supportive um, and, it, and his supporters are supportive of these Republican candidates. That's their calculation. Um, I think it is a dangerous calculation because remembering what happened and, and, and recognizing the importance of what happened and the significance of what happened is important, essential to ensuring it doesn't happen again. And they think that once again, like they've thought so many other times that they can somehow manage Donald Trump and control him. And I don't think that's the case either. And if he runs again, which I'm I'm actually one of the few people that's doubtful that he will, but he might. And I mean, he certainly sounds like he's running again. Um, you know, then what? Then what do Republicans do? They're, they're, they're saddled with a candidate who would likely win the Republican nomination and would almost certainly lose a general election uh, because of the way he has alienated everybody else besides hardcore Republican voters. Um, and if he would win, I mean, then what? I mean, they all saw the disaster that unfolded. They didn't like it. They knew how bad it was. You can't just ignore it. You got to deal with it. You got to confront it. This is Liz Cheney's passion. I mean, she, she says that her you know, two most important objectives right now are one, to ensure Donald Trump is not the Republican nominee, 
And two, if he somehow is the Republican nominee, that he doesn't win again. You know, as you get into the last six weeks of the election, you lay out some of the people, you know, it, it, he keeps going around until he finds people who tell him what he wants to hear. Jeffrey Clark, Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, Jenna Ellis, John Eastman. And the attitude is essentially, he's running out of time. It's a mess. Jared Kushner, I don't want to be involved. You know, just leave it alone and it'll go away. And that turns out to not be the right attitude. So if he were to run again and he were to win again, will we see a continuation of just stay away from the mess or do you think people would behave differently? I, I had a conversation with a very senior official um, who served until the end and, and was one of those who I think really stayed because they felt they could, they could, they could do good things and prevent him from you know, going completely off the rails, um, who in a, in a way that was kind of haunting to me, uh, said to me, I, I, I just, I, I don't know what would have happened if he had won. What would the second term cabinet look like? What would, what would the second term West Wing look like? I mean, a Trump completely uninhibited, and Johnny McIntyre, who we spoke, we spoke about, he would be the one helping him choose every single one of those positions. And there would be none of those around who would want to, you know, rein him in in any way. Or, you know, I mean, the, the John Kellys of the world would be completely gone. The McIntyres, the Stuart Clarks, the, the Jenna Ellis's, the Mark Meadows, they would be, they would be the ones running his, running his executive branch. I wanted to talk about two other Republican leaders because they're in similar yet different places. And you talk about Mitch McConnell, who, you know, it's well known. He hates Trump and Trump hates him. But he decides after January 6th, he makes, you know, he finally starts to make say, some a statement six weeks after he perhaps should have. But he starts to realize this thing is getting away from him when it comes to that certification vote, that he thinks he's put out the word, this is what we're doing. Josh Hawley defies him, Ted Cruz defies him. And I wondered about the future tale of that because he sees himself as such a powerful person. And when in such a defining moment, you see these young bucks defy you, what does that mean going into the future for Mitch McConnell and his party in the Senate? Well, you know, M McConnell is, is a student of political power and, and he, is not shy, obviously, about exercising that power. I mean, I describe in the book, it's, it's, it's almost an aside, but it's, it's, it's a real window about how right after Ruth Bader Ginsburg called, uh, died, uh, he, he, he talked to Trump, I mean, literally right after, um, and told him, okay, this is what you do. You wait until the memorial is over, and then you announce Amy Coney Barrett is your nominee, and we push her through, and that's what happened. Um, so he was able to work quite from McConnell's point of view, quite productively with Donald Trump until, you know, until he went way too far. Um, but now McConnell believes Trump is gone. Um, he's not going to come back. I, I believe that firmly is McConnell's view. Um, but that but that fighting with him would be counterproductive for Republicans gaining control. Um, there, there's a moment, there's a very, very poignant moment um, where that, that I learned about in reporting for this book where McConnell has just come out against the independent commission to look into January 6th. And Liz Cheney is crushed by this. You know, Liz Cheney heard what McConnell said and go back and listen to McConnell's speech in the impeachment trial. It is as harsh a condemnation of a sitting president that any member of Congress has ever made from the Senate floor. Um, and, you know, he didn't vote to convict and he had his kind of technical reason why he didn't. Uh, but that is a thorough and total condemnation of Donald Trump. And Liz Cheney was, as that was happening, effectively applauding it on, applauding it on. And then McConnell comes out against the commission. So Liz Cheney sends her a quote um, uh, from uh, about uh, about uh, about McCullough, the, uh, the, um, the the great historian, talking about the statue of the goddess Cleo or the muse Cleo, the muse of history. And this is a statue that's in Statuary Hall and it and it, it's up above the corridor. So it, co Congress 
men and women see it as they come by. And this, the goddess Cleo has a notebook and she's taking notes. And as McCullough, as David McCullough recounts, taking notes for history. So think about what you do because history is watching. So she sent this note to, um, to McConnell, in other words, saying, you know, history is watching. How could you do this? And McConnell ignores it, but calls her a couple of weeks later. And she sees the call coming in from Mitch McConnell and thinks maybe he's calling, if not to apologize, to explain why he did what he did. No, he's calling in with a very firm admonition, telling Liz Cheney, stop talking about Trump. Stop picking a fight with Trump. It's not going to help the party and it's not going to help you move on, talk about other things, you know, and that's, that's the kind of divide as, as it stands with those who are, were horrified by what Donald Trump did, but have entirely different approaches about what to do about it. And then there's Kevin McCarthy over in the house who is a bit more naked as you lay out in the book, whatever it takes to become you know, House Speaker, that's what he's going to do. And we find ourselves in a current environment uh, where you have the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Paul Gosars, all the crazy stuff going on that he seems hesitant to want to deal with as he cleaves to Trump. And I wondered, especially, you know, in our, you know, I just imagine John Boehner somewhere drinking a glass of wine, smoking a cigarette, going, you have fun with that, Kevin. Um, is he making the right deal or you know, he's going to be sorry, he's going to get that job. And it's not going to quite be what he thought it was going to be, that he's losing control as we speak. So Kevin McCarthy has a view of leadership, I believe, that is different from what, uh, obviously different than what uh, somebody like Liz Cheney would see. But his view of leadership is that he should reflect the opinions and the views of a majority of his of his conference of, of the Republicans, as opposed to lead and direct and put them in 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 a, in a productive direction. He he wants to truly represent those that elected him as as the Republican leader, and the, the challenge that that he faces. And I outline. I mean, you know, it's clear from my conversations with him that he wasn't a true believer in any of this stuff, um, but he certainly didn't stand up to try to stop it. And he didn't stand up to try to stop it uh, because he believed it wouldn't have been effective and, and he would be out as leader and all the terrible things that were happening would have happened anyway. And he points to, a, to, to some things that he did, which he think prevented a, a, a greater catastrophe. And in one case, he's absolutely right, which is, uh, if you remember Donald Trump right around Christmas time, last year threatened to veto the COVID relief bill and threatened to veto the spending bill, which would have been a government shutdown. So this is just as we're trying to get vaccines up and running, just as we're in the midst of the worst stages of the pandemic, having a government shutdown and an end to all COVID relief. And Trump was doing it on a, you know, on a temper tantrum, basically. And McCarthy believes, and I think he's actually totally right about this, that he was very instrumental in, in, in convincing Trump that that would have been a disaster and he shouldn't veto it. But, you know, he wouldn't stand up to him on, on the really big thing, which is trying to overturn the election. We've had some viewer questions. We're down to like the last 10, 12 minutes. So let's do some lightning rounds here. We've got about seven. What guardrails are being put in place today to have more oversight in the election process so that it happens as our forefathers planned. Are there loopholes that can be sealed? My guess is yes, but where the parties are now, it doesn't matter. They can't come together on anything. I, I, this is where I think I'm, 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 I have bad news. I, there, there's not enough being done and what's being done is being done on party line basis, which is not productive and not good. Uh, so I'm gonna endorse the Tam Edwards idea, which is uh, as you outlined here, a bipartisan effort to do some things to reassure everybody that elections are have integrity. I don't think they can find people that everybody, it is, the respectable means nothing. Anybody they find, somebody will say, well, that's a rhino or that's a whatever. I don't know who would sit on that panel and have the power of, let's say, the 9-11 commission. Who informed the insurrectionists where the office of the parliamentarian was located? 
It's a great question, and it's something that the January 6th commission should try to find out. I don't do you know. Can, go, do you consider Pence a hero or but for one big thing, a fawning sycophant? Well, it's not for me to make that judgment. I, I would just say that in that moment, uh, he did the right thing, and it prevented a much bigger disaster from, from happening. A number of questions on this one. Since January 6th may have been a dry run, what do you think will happen if Trump, they say, steals the 2024 election, I think I would say if he wins the election and what institution could stop this? Will the country be transformed, as Anna Applebaum is warning us, into an autocracy? Well, if Trump runs again, he will certainly never acknowledge he lost, even if he loses. But the difference this time is he won't be sitting in, in, in the Oval Office. Uh, he won't have the power that he had uh, to try to overturn it. He'll just be a, you know, a loser sitting down in Mar-a-Lago or wherever he is. Um, but, I, but I am more fearful, and this, I guess, gets to your Ann Applebaum point of if we have a, a country where a critical mass of, of voters doesn't trust an election and where different sides of the political spectrum have a, don't agree on the basic facts, uh, then we have a much bigger problem that is, you know, more profound than just one man, one one figure. It's it it goes beyond Donald Trump. I want you to actually take some time with this next one because it's about us. Does the media accept any responsibility for how Trump has been able to continue the lie and play down January six? In your book, you're very clear that you have tried, especially in your role as a leader in the White House press corps to say, we should not be the opposition party. We should be careful about our language. I wonder if you regret that. Should we have been harsher and say a lie is a lie sooner? And how do you assess the media right now in terms of that question? You know, first of all, I'm very uncomfortable with the notion of the media as, a, as one, you know, monolithic, uh, what is the media? I mean, you know, Tam's got a job. I've got a job. Uh, New York Times, uh, there are different reporters at the New York Times that have very different approaches to, to how they do it. Um, the, uh, you know, the various online publications, television, radio. I mean, who, what is the media? Um, uh, so I, I'm very reluctant to, to make big generalizations, but to try to engage on this. Um, I, I think it is important for, for us as reporters uh, to not take sides in terms of a, of a political uh, context, but, but to never be reluctant to point out and to, and to point out lies and to pursue the truth and to, and to, and to make the truth our, 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 our guidestone. I mean, we are, you know, I'm, I'm the one who in, in the White House briefing room back in September of last year asked Donald Trump, why did you lie to the American people and why, you know, how can we trust anything you say now? And, and I, I think that we shouldn't mince words. When something is a lie, it needs to be exposed. And we shouldn't use our platforms as a, as a way to, you know, to, to, to allow people to spread those lies. But unfortunately, we, I mean, we, we live in a, in, in, in a world where lies can be spread um, and they don't need ABC News or ABC6 or the New York Times. Uh, and, and it makes it all the more important for us to go out there as reporters and say, this is what the truth is and this is why, and to do it in a very ineffectual basis. You know, who was it that said, was it Mark Twain, um, that a lie makes its way around the world before the truth can get, get its, its shoes, shoes on? on. Yeah. Um, I mean, th that was before Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that really can get around and, 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 and combating that misinformation is, is essential. And I think it's become maybe always has been a core part of our jobs. You know, and I, everybody gives Fox a hard time, but I find myself thinking about MSNBC in this context, because so much of what people watch is opinionated journalism. And for months, Morning Joe was very cozy with Donald Trump until they weren't. And everybody seems to have forgotten this. And I wonder if we learned something out of that, that whole experience. Do you think we did? Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly, and what you're referring to is even before Trump became president during the 2016 campaign, um, you know, I, I think that there's been a lot of rethinking, and this is largely a cable television uh, reassessment. Um, 
you know, CNN carried in the early days of that Republican primary, you know, Donald Trump speeches were, 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 were carried start to finish. And, you know, there were even points where before he came out, they would have the image of the empty podium and say, coming soon, you know, Trump is speaking in Grand Rapids uh, or whatever. Um, and, you know, CNN stopped doing that. They actually stopped doing that well before the, the 2016 election. Um, but I think that I think that there's been a lot of reassessment. I also I've said this in the past. I think that the one thing, the one problem and the, the one thing that I think everybody would reassess that, that works in, in our business is when Donald Trump first became a candidate, nobody took him seriously. Nobody really thought he had a chance of winning. They thought it was kind of a sideshow. And he did not face the kind of scrutiny and the investigative reporting that uh, that the other candidates received. So in other words, we had a lot more, you know, digging into what Marco Rubio did about this or that or Jeb Bush. And, and, and there was very little on Trump because, you know, he was not considered. And I'll give you, by the way, this is a really good example of this. Um, the, the, the group American Bridge, this is not a journalism group, but this is a this is a a um, pro you know, liberal left advocacy group, American Bridge, who set out to research and document problems with each of the Republican candidates. They produced a book going into the 2016 election. I have it in my office, not my home office here, but my office at ABC. And it's a great document because it has like something like 22 potential Republican candidates and has a chapter on each one. And it talks about, well, they voted here. They did this. They said that there's, and you know, guess what? There's no chapter for Donald Trump because they didn't take him seriously. They didn't think he was actually going to run. <laughs> if he, did, he wasn't going to be a serious candidate. Um, so this tremendous research document, you know, by a pro-democratic group, digging into all the dirt and controversy the guy. About all the potential uh, Republican candidates in 2016 didn't have in this book a single page on Donald Trump. Somebody asked, is Michael Flynn still closely aligned with DJT? Should we be concerned after his recent event in Texas where he pushed the notion of a national Christian religion? If Trump runs again, do you think he would endorse this way of thinking? And do all the inner circle family members buy into the big lie? A lot in that question. There's a lot in that question. So um, I, I, I don't know if Flynn has direct contact with Trump right now. Um, certainly he has close contact with people that are close to Trump. Um, I don't think Trump would endorse that idea. Um, I, you know, I think that he, he relishes his support, for instance, of, uh, you know, Jewish Republicans. And I just, I just don't, I, I, I don't think that that would happen. In terms of the family members, um, it's been very interesting to watch. Uh, Jared and Ivanka have clearly made an effort, um, and you've seen it in some of the other books that have been written, to try to let people know that they opposed uh, the effort to overturn the election, that they thought it was nuts, that, that you know Ivanka was proud of Mike Pence for what he did, all of this. They haven't said this stuff publicly that I've seen, uh, but you know those stories don't come out of nowhere. And, and what I report in the book is that Jared uh, was, you know, Jared Kushner was central to the campaign. He wasn't the campaign manager, but he was more important than the campaign manager. And in the first few days, he was there as they prepared for their legal challenges. And then when Rudy Giuliani came in, he peaced out. I describe a scene. Yeah. He, he's gone. And he, he goes off and he, he doesn't have anything to do with it anymore. And then... Uh, Mike Pence's chief of staff, uh, Mark Short, reaches him right around during the holidays when this talk of Pence overturning the election is, is being pushed by Trump. And, uh, and, and Short reaches out to Jared and says, hey, you got to help me. I mean, this is really important. You're the only one he'll listen to. Please call your, go and see your father-in-law and tell him that the vice president can't do this, that it's nonsense, that he's being told lies. And Jared's answer was, you know, I'm, I haven't been involved since Giuliani got, in, got into this. And, you know, I'm really busy right now with the Middle East and Middle East peace efforts. So I, you know, it's not really my thing. 
um, a couple of quick ones before we let you go. Is there any decent Republican who could possibly win over the party? I guess define decent is up to you, but is there, I guess, any traditional, any anyone who could be a consensus candidate, anybody that you see that you go, I really wish they would run? You know, I don't know. And again, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be my place to say that. But but I think that it, it will be interesting to see, you know, the, the, the current leadership has entirely exiled Liz Cheney. And, um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that she will lose her, her seat in Wyoming and that she is done as a Republican. I'm not so sure. Let's see what she does. Let's see where it goes. Um, but but I would be watching I would be watching her very carefully. And um and then you have other more complicated figures. I mean, like, you know, Chris Christie is out there. You know, there are a lot of people that look at what he's saying now, which is critical of Trump and, and say it's too little too late. But I think it's interesting to see if Where it that goes. resonates at all with, with rank and file Republicans. I don't know the answer. Um, you cover Trumpism from the beginning and that somebody says, is Trumpism rooted in race? Well, it certainly seems that it is at times um and and when i watched the way he handled the aftermath of george floyd it really you know really seemed to be that way when i saw it during the campaign where he couldn't get around to uh condemning david duke until he was really you know kind of ber kind of berated and, and and forced into it it sure looked that way but there's also i mean one of the tr truth truths of 2020 is that Trump's share of uh, African American and Hispanic vote went up. I, it was still small, but it went up. It went up, and he did. I mean, he, would have, he did better among uh, Hispanic voters, Latino voters, than than Mitt Romney did. And voting experts the guy are still. That, you know, the guy that said send the rapists and the drug dealers back to Mexico. The guy that talked about the wall and all this. So. You know, it's a complicated question. And I'll end on this one. You said something earlier where you said you don't think he's running. And I think after you've spent all this time and written this book, people, I'm sure you get this all the time. You know, why do you believe that um, when there's every reason, you know, that he could cakewalk to the nomination? Why do you think he won't? Because I don't think that he wants to face the possibility of losing again. And by the way, I thought, and it might, I'm sure there are other reasons, including financial reasons, but he's selling the Trump International Hotel right down the road from the White House. Um, so he's getting rid of a very important asset in Washington, D.C., right on Pennsylvania Avenue, 1100 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, so, I, like, again, I may be wrong. I, I wouldn't be, I won't be shocked if he runs. People think, I think the conventional wisdom is he does run people around him say he's going to run but i just i don't think that he wants to face the possibility of losing again even though of course he would never admit he lost again i don't think he wants to face that possibility when you finished the book and you were done and you were ready to turn it in i wondered what emotion you had because i've heard you privately talk about it i've heard you publicly talk about it and it definitely seems as though the last year affected you and changed you and I didn't know if what I was hearing was sadness, if what I was hearing is that you were scared. How would you describe, you know, as you said, I'm done, what you felt? Thank you for asking. I mean, I, I, I felt, you know, that it, this was, this is the most important work I've ever done in my life. Um, I, I felt that I really want people to read this book and I want people to know what happened. And I want this to be part of the history so that it cannot be erased. Um, and so that we can learn and prevent something like, from this happening again. And that may sound, I don't know, overly self-important or whatever, but th th these, th this was my feeling. I felt like this was, this was a mission this was more than a than a journalistic project. Um, I was writing this, you know, in, in, in a way for my kids. Um, I, I was writing this with the with the hope, and and maybe it's you know, I I know this is a tough one, but I want people who really like Donald Trump to read this book. I want people who believe that the election was stolen to read this book, 
And I hope that I can make a contribution to changing some of those some of those misperceptions and some and 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 to, and, to, and to causing people to see that lies are lies and truth is truth. Um, so I. And I also, if I can just say, I also kind of wished I had a few more months because I, <laughs> um, I, I worked day in and day out throughout much of, most of this year on this book, but I, but I felt like there was more I wanted to do. Um, but, uh, but I was at the same point, the same time, I was eager to get it out, wanted to get it out quickly. Well, they say the truth will set you free. <laughs> and you hopefully this work that you put into the world will free people to think critically and hard about where we're going, because in the end, all we have is each other. And that's really what's at stake in the days ahead. Thank you again, John. Um, it's an honor to be your colleague and your, your friend at a distance. And we appreciate your good work. Good luck with the book and good luck with the tour. Thank you, Tam. Uh, like, like we said at the start, we go back a very long way. <laughs> and, uh, we were children. Um, we, were, we, were, we, we were just little kids out there, but it's great to see you again. And I hope to see you in person soon. We love that. All the best. Take care. Bye.